Welcome to Maxwell Institute Conversations, special videocast episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast, hosted by Terrell Givens and created in collaboration with Faith Matters Foundation. You can watch this episode in your podcast app, or if you're on the run, listen to the audio version. Thomas F. Rogers is a noted Latter-day Saint playwright, essayist, scholar, and a former BYU professor. He's written extensively on the relationship between reason and faith. The Neil A. Maxwell Institute published a collection of his writings as part of our Living Faith book series. The book is called Let Your Hearts and Minds Expand, Reflections on Faith, Reason, Charity, and Beauty. Terrell Givens sits down to talk with Rogers about his deep interest in human connection, the family of God. What can you say about discipleship as a kind of risk-taking venture. It needs to be that for all of us. And uh, the, the people we read about in Scripture, the prophets and others, apostles in the New Testament, they had to do that. They had to walk the razor's edge as Christ himself did. And I think that uh, we need more of that challenge. I think it's available to us if we respond Thomas F. Rogers joins Terrell Givens in this episode of Maxwell Institute Conversations. Hello and welcome to Faith Matters Foundation's Conversations with Terrell Givens, a video cast devoted to exploring the experience of lived Mormonism as a catalyst to the abundant life and the public good. I am your host and our guest today is playwright, linguist, and uh, artist Thomas Rogers, and we're uh, delighted to have you with us today, Tom. Thank you, I'm very honored. Well, I like to start uh, by having my guests introduce themselves to the larger public, and uh, <laughs> so why don't we do it this way? Why don't we ask you what, uh, what three things do you expect would probably be in your obituary? Well, uh, I'm, I rather think it will be like any other. Uh, you, they will, t- recall the uh, family relationships I have, who my parents were and our, our family and children. And then uh, probably what I've done professionally. I ended up being a teacher of Russian language and literature throughout my career uh, after uh, switching at Yale in the graduate school, after two years at the Yale School of Drama where I was writing plays. But that still stuck with me somehow. It came back later. It came back later, about 15 years later. And meanwhile, uh, I took, uh, they made the mistake, I guess you could say, of uh, taking one elective in the second year at the School of Drama, which was uh, in Pushkin. It was a year-length course. We read his great novel in verse, which Tchaikovsky made use of very faithful use of for the libretto of his greatest opera, Eugene Onegin. Uh, and uh, that turned my head. I had to go back to Russian. I had studied it as an undergrad is all. And uh, never regretted it, even though I was, I think, maybe about a year away from a doctorate of fine arts in, in the uh, theater. The theater program. But... Uh, took another eight years for me to get my degree in Russian, attending uh, after two years Yale, then again uh, uh, at Georgetown University, where I first began to teach as well across town at Howard University and taught Russian and German, uh, and then moved to the U of U for three years and intended, that's my alma mater, intended to be there indefinitely, but. Uh, the institution 40 miles to the south r- rolled out its red carpet and uh, enticed me there. And that was a great thing, too. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more maybe later about the promptings that have caused me to make these choices along the way. So that, that accounts for what I did uh, professionally. The third, uh, I think, thing that... that uh, the obituary would probably mention is my church callings. Right. What were some of those? Uh, well, uh, it, uh, it happened after I got, for the most part, after I got back, to, uh, got to the to the Y. I wasn't acquainted with the Y. I, I'd never really been there on that campus to speak of, till I did uh, agree to uh, 
to go there. And I, I even, you know, we were interviewed by apostles back then. Right. Uh, the faculty were, and uh, it was LeGrand Richards who took me on. And finally I said to him, Brother Richards, tell me that this is a calling. And then that, I thought that would that's, take care of it. I would be then obligated to go. And he said, <laughs> no, it's just a job. <laughs> so I, I had to make that choice, too. It was certainly a providential one, and uh, lots of wonderful opportunities came along with that that I don't think would have been the case at the U. Uh, uh, both uh, in uh, academic, I directed the honors program at BYU for a time, and, uh, and ecclesiastical. I was uh, the president of what was then called a student branch, now they're student wards, uh, and uh, then uh, for three years, branch president at the MTC, and uh, n never could an have anticipated that I would ever, or, or even my students, would have an opportunity to be missionaries in Russia itself till the fall of the uh, Iron Curtain. And then all of a sudden they needed some mission presence over there, particularly those who knew Russian. And I think, I'm sure that's the only reason I was called to do that. But uh, that, uh, no other school, if you were on the faculty, would say, go ahead and take three years off. You know, we'll, uh, we'll keep your position for you, but except for BYU. So one of the first mission presidents in Russia. Yes. And uh, then you returned for subsequent church service in Russia in your later years. Oh, yes. Uh, well, in fact... Uh, after retiring, uh, Miriam and I, my wife and I, uh, we were asked to teach for a year at, at Peking University, uh, English, to graduate students in China. And that was memorable, too. And then shortly after that, uh, we were called to the uh, Swedish temple in Stockholm, uh, because at that time, the many, uh, the several uh, church missions uh, all sent their, their uh, members to Stockholm to, to go to the temple. And they needed somebody to coordinate that. So that, that was for a year and a half. And then uh, more recently, uh, I was called to be a patriarch for all of Eastern Europe, uh, one of the, of a couple. And uh, that, uh, that lasted for eight years. It took about 25 a total of 25 transatlantic trips, two of them global circumnavigations. And uh, after about 2,660 blessings uh, and uh, about five trips, five, three to five trips a year, uh, I had that great experience. So you're well-traveled uh, professionally and, uh, and ecclesiastically. <laughs> And I would say spiritually as well. In fact, I, I consider you kind of an encyclopedia of spiritual insights. Tom. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, many of which are, are collected in this wonderful collection, Let Your Hearts and Mind Expand, which I may be referring to a little bit later in our conversation. But I'd like to explore a little bit, if we could, uh, your own spiritual formation. And uh, one way I like to phrase this question is to refer to the poet Wordsworth, who in his great prelude wrote that there are in our existence spots of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and he refers to the renovating virtue of those moments that are pivotal and foundational and formative. And I wonder if you could choose two or three okay. moments in your life that, uh, that shifted your direction. Well, I, I hope that's true for everybody, that they have these spiritual promptings, which they don't even anticipate and, nor uh, recognize as such. That has certainly been true in my case. I hear people, and I hear the admonition to uh, people to search prayerfully and, 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 and uh, anxiously for answers. You know, I haven't done that in too many instances. I haven't needed to, but the, the opportunity came and the prompting, the suggestion somehow, willy-nilly, that I make a choice and uh, I had always to make that choice, and that's what led me to BYU, as a matter of fact. It's also what led me to uh, switch from, I, I believe, from theater to Russian. 
And uh, then uh, there were a number of instances of that later, but even before, I was uh, the uh, uh, president, the uh, inter-chapter president of the church fraternity at the University of Utah in connection with the Institute of Religion, which was then called Lambda Delta Sigma for LDS. And uh, its uh, founder was Lowell Benyon, who was one of my great spiritual mentors, incidentally, and who, uh, had, uh, who was the director at the time as well at the U. And uh, so I was very active in that organization, which would tend to suggest, would it not, that uh, I was, um, you know, t totally with it, spiritually. However, I certainly had no intention to serve a mission at that time, even into my senior year. Uh, I, my uh, peers were called at, uh, after their sophomore year, and they dutifully went. And I wasn't going to waste that uh, two, and two years or so uh, for, for on that. However, in that senior year, uh, I, my bishop happened to be the manager of the uh, genealogical society, or the archives of it. And uh, he employed some of us in the ward to do part-time work at the archives on weekends, which uh, I was doing. And why this didn't occur to me s sooner, I don't know. I was very satisfied with my professors at the U. But I, I suddenly had a sense about so many of them that their religion was their discipline, and they were very good at it. But I said to myself, unexpectedly, one day sitting at the archives, you know, life has to have more to it than just that, than just to pursue a particular academic or intellectual discipline. And... Um, so it caused me to rise from my desk, to go upstairs and knock on the office door of my bishop and ask him to call me on a mission, which he did, managed to do. And, uh, but that wasn't uh, the end of that test. Uh, after I got to Germany, our mission was headquartered in Berlin. I wasn't there for very long before I realized for the first time I couldn't really be sure that the message I was bringing these people was divine and the truth. And uh, without knowing that, I just could not continue. So I, even in desperation, wrote a letter to the, the apostle who had sent me apart as a missionary, Hubie Brown. Fortunately, it was Hubie Brown. And... Uh, he sent me a consoling letter, understanding, and uh, made me under, uh, sense that was well, something I'd been taught in primary, frankly, that, but I had never really applied it seriously. And that was how you get a testimony. So I, uh, I it, it, and, and I also wrote another per person, a young woman that I had known at uh, at the Institute of Religion. Why it was I selected her uh, is, is also uh, telling, I think. I didn't, uh, but she wrote me back too, and that was very helpful. Well, anyway, um, weeks went by and nothing changed that much. Uh, I was desperate to, I, would be, I wouldn't face my family and friends by going back if I had to stop being a missionary. I, I'd be too, too chagrined and embarrassed. So. I had studied French as well as Russian, and I thought, I'll go to France, I'll join the Foreign Legion. Now, <laughs> isn't that uh, adolescent? I was in my early 20s already, but you know, uh, that, was, uh, that was how I, I was thinking to myself. Little realizing that, that had I done that a year later or so, I would probably have been uh, in Algeria and, and, been, and been, been shot during dead rough times. during that conflict. Uh, but I do so well remember the one morning when I was sitting by myself. Our uh, missionary apartment was attached to the chapel in Hanover, which was my first assignment there. I was studying grammar and the scriptures and the discussions 
uh, this is before we had an LTM or an MTC. And all of a sudden, I looked at the blank wall in front of me, and I knew. I just knew. There was no drama attached to that, no thunderbolt from, Ju from Zeus. It had come for me. And uh, that's over 60 years ago. I cannot dismiss the memory of that or, or the, the confidence and the certainty that came with that realization. It made all the difference. Also, then I was prompted to write a letter just shortly after that to that young woman, sending her my Lambda Delta Sigma President's pin, since I didn't have a ring for her. We, I still had over, it was a two and a half year mission, which language missions were then. And uh, on great faith, she had to wait for me to return. We were married nine days after my return uh, in the Salt Lake Temple. We were sealed there by Apostle Richard L. Evans. Lovely. So that's another instance of this. Now I'll just quickly cite two more, if I may. And they, they seem uh, very strange. Uh, and, and very irrelevant in a spiritual sense, but uh, I had forgotten that I'd even written a play while I was so busy, you know, involved in teaching Russian and particularly Russian literature until a colleague of ours in the Department of Germanic and Slavic Languages, Alan Kiel, making a presentation to the College of, the, of Humanities at BYU, to the, to the faculty on one occasion, uh, which I attended, Suddenly, and he was citing what two uh, very famous post-World War II German novelists had written f in favor, very favorable toward the young German martyr who was LDS, who was beheaded by Hitler at age 17 for protesting Hitler. Helmut Hübner. Helmut Hübner, yes. And these two novelists had in turn in their work both Nobel Prize winning novelists, Günther Grass and Heinrich Böhl, cited Hübner and, and the uh, affair regarding him very uh, in glowing terms. And suddenly Alan turned and pointed at me in the audience, knowing about my background at Yale, I guess, and said, Tom, you should write a play about that. And uh, yes, Another prompting in that form. A light bulb went on. I, I was then honors program director. I was a campus branch president. I got a phone call every 15 minutes during the waking day. The next two nights I stayed up, not only for therapy, but in order to write the first draft of that play, which, as you know, was more than just another play at BYU. It was a happening, it was a sensation. In the final week of the many long extended runs we had of it, I saw students sitting in serpentine circles uh, on the floor of the Fine Arts Building waiting for the box office to open, kind of like you'd expect to be the case over at the Marriott Center for some athletic event. Yeah, now another happened after my We're going to come back to that. Okay. Okay, and another happened after that, my retirement, uh, rather than just sit on the porch and, uh, and vegetate, which I think a lot of people sadly do after they retire, I uh, had an occasion to, to, I wanted to find a pink pearl eraser of all things. I had never, uh, I, I, that'd been my favorite eraser for over the years. I think even when I was in junior high and you couldn't find them anymore. So I thought there was a stationary store in, on Main Street in Bountiful it's Cars Stationery, K-A-R-R. -R. And I thought maybe they would carry one. So I went there. They did have, they did have a, a, a pink pearl. I bought several. And then the clerk said to me, now if you go through that archive right there, it looked like it was part of the store, not archive, what am I trying to say, my, that uh, arch. <laughs> um, and you should look at, at the gallery. What gallery? There was a, a, an art gallery attached to it. They were renting the, it's, uh, to the artists. I had no idea. 
I said, what gallery? And she pointed the way, and I went there. I had made a turn inside of the arch. The first painting I looked at was a pastel portrait of a young girl in a wool dress, uh, in a wool sweater. And uh, for the first time in my life, I looked at a painting and said, I want to do something like that. And then I looked at the uh, signature of the artist. It was Anne Chesley. And I said aloud, who is Anne Chesley? And a woman standing next to me, closer than you are, sitting across from me at this moment, said, I am Anne Chesley, <laughs> one of the artists there at the Lamplight Art Gallery. I, she was my first teacher. And I have been involved with them as one of the co-op members ever since. Uh, and uh, I've painted well over 500 portraits and many landscapes from photos always. Photos I took while I was in Eastern Europe. In uh, many of them of Swedish members and uh, Russian members who came to the Swedish temple. Um, I would take their picture and then I, I had, and I do pastels. Uh, uh, the pastel portraits, particularly of the couples that I had sealed there at that temple. And, um, and you become an accomplished artist. I own two prints of your works. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm flattered. And you exhibit in the gallery in, yeah. in Bountiful. Yeah. So anyway, that's, what, that's how that happened. Another prompting, another odd prompting, you could right. almost say. Right. I, I'd like to think that that's true for everybody, that... Those come into their lives. Why, why am I an exception? Right, right. Well, I want to turn to, to the first two that you mentioned and kind of weave them together. Um, your first spot of time was a moment that confirmed you in a kind of discipleship. And then your writing of the Hubner play described a trajectory in which you explore some of the particular tensions in the life of a disciple. Uh, Gene England, by the way, called you the greatest playwright uh, that Mormonism has. I think he called me the father of, of <laughs> modern Mormon drama. I think he also said you were the greatest oh, practitioner gosh. of the art as well. well. And, and that's that's the sentiment with which <laughs> I'm in agreement. But it can't be a coincidence that your two most renowned plays, Hubner and Fire in the Bones, um, both describe a disciple caught in a particularly <laughs> agonizing predicament. Uh, That's right. So I want you to talk about what those two plays have in common, why that particular kind of dilemma yes. appeals to you. And if you wouldn't mind, for those tuning in, if you could give a very quick overview of each one of those plays, if they're not familiar okay. with them. Well, uh, Helmut Hubner is, uh, in my view, one of uh, the, perhaps, greatest most important martyr, LDS martyr of the whole 20th century. Uh, he uh, was listening to BBC broadcasts in, in German. Uh, they were uh, contradicting the propaganda that he was getting and others in Germany. From This him. would have been at the beginning of the war. I wish I could recall the exact years now. It might or might not have been the beginning. But it's after the rise of Hitler to power. Oh, after Hitler's rise, yes. It was in Hamburg. That's where he lived. He ended up, uh, he was the clerk to the district president of the church in Hamburg. Uh, as a young man, only 16 or 17. And uh, he used the mimeograph machine in the district office in order to turn out propaganda uh, pamphlets uh, con uh, arguing against Hitler and what he was doing. And then he recruited two other young LDS boys, friends of his, in Hamburg to help him distribute them and uh, clandestinely wh wherever they could in public places until they got caught and then arrested. And uh, he was younger than the others. At their uh, show trial in Berlin, uh, the prosecuting attorney said that he had the mind of a 30-year-old professor and therefore he, he deserved to be executed as an adult, which he wasn't. And by the existing law, he should not have been executed. But he, he took on the responsibility for the whole thing. 
He was 17. He was 17 when he was beheaded, yeah. And the other two were arrested. They were uh, sent to uh, the army and otherwise, uh, and uh, they survived, and they ended up in uh, Salt Lake, both of them. I got to know them. And other principles in the whole story. His uh, branch president uh, was uh, a Nazi himself, and uh, I've made him look pretty good in the play. Uh, he did not know, in fact, about what he, he, Helmut was doing until after his arrest. Um, but uh, I have them have a, con a confrontation, an Aegon, where they they argue with each other about the merits or demerits of what, what uh, he's doing, which I think is one of the better scenes in the whole play. There's another scene where his mother comes to visit him before his execution. That never happened either. She only learned about it when she saw it on a poster one, one morning in Hamburg and so forth. But that's the, the story of Helmut Hubner. The other, uh, <laughs> which I wrote right afterward, uh, deals with uh, John D. Lee, uh, who uh, was a very valuable member of the church. He helped provision the saints when they came here uh, in 47. And uh, he uh, was a great uh, Indian uh, representative. He, he uh, negotiated with the Indians, farmer, and so forth. And uh, he, he was actually, I think, Brigham Young's first adopted son, as, according to that tradition. But uh, then uh, we had Mountain Meadows Massacre, which he was uh, foremost in, uh, in leading and uh, later scapegoated, I believe, in order to find somebody to blame and was executed also, like, like Helmut had been, would be, um, after a, a, a federal trial in Salt Lake City. Well, uh, So there's certainly not parallel characters. They're not at all. And, and not exactly parallel predicaments, but what, but what did they But they share? both were, uh, were model members of the church who were both excommunicated before their deaths and, and executed. They had that in common. But there's another broader background that I didn't recognize at the time that came, came to my attention after I'd written even more plays. And I could see that they were all edible, that uh, I, I had a, a, a situation that had occurred to me, usually in, bi in somebody's biography, not, not made up, where uh, a younger person or was uh, in contention with his parent or surrogate father, which the branch president was for Helmut Hubner, and which Brigham Young was for John D. Lee. And then I realized that this was me subconsciously uh, re reflecting my own con uh, crisis conflict in these characters. I, I was relating to them, identifying with them that much. My father was um, committed to a mental institution when I was an infant, and he, he remained there for about 17 to 18 years throughout my youth, my childhood and youth, then returned to our family. So it was similar in that re regard. I think, as I, if you can ever psychoanalyze yourself, I think that was one of the factors. But then after writing those two plays, I suddenly realized I'm in a rut here. I'd better not write about excommunicants who have been executed, you know. Uh, now, Hubner was rehabilitated, right? They both were by the uh, First Presidency. Subsequently, after World War II, he was. And then later, also, Hubner, uh, John D. Lee. So, uh, so then uh, I wrote a third play which we had a number of stage readings of at the Y uh, with a faculty from the Department of English who participated in those. And uh, it's called Reunion. It's set during a general conference session in Salt Lake City and uh, where adult children come to be with their parents. One is a uh, 
straight-laced high councilman uh, who's a letter of the law type, and the other is a, a very uh, permissive liberal uh, professor uh, who is no longer an active member of the church. And they spar with each other. And my sense was that the ultimate truth must go, must transcend their arguments. And that's represented by their father, their dying father, who was, uh, was dismissed at one point as a seminary teacher for various reasons. And he wants to bring them together somehow. So the play, that play ends, all of these plays ended with a, a, a ritual, uh, which was like a libation or something. In this case, he asked his sons to bless him prior to you know, the end of the, the curtain, including a younger son who's about to go on a mission who became, becomes so disillusioned with the bickering of his older brothers that he's reconsidering going. And uh, when the, uh, the inactive professor son is asked by the father to be the voice for the blessing, he says, why me? And his father answers, it'll do you good. <laughs> and we leave it at that. We don't have the prayer. In the, in the case of uh, John D. Lee, it's his execution. That, that play begins with his, uh, his execution and ends with it. That's the frame of it. So um, I don't know if you'd agree with my characterization of your work, but I'd say you're, uh, you're a disciple's provocateur. <laughs> you, <laughs> because <laughs> you, you are committed you continue to be deeply committed to your spiritual roots. Um, and yet you've written, I'm just going to quote some of the, the phrases from your collected be, be, works. Before you go on, let me just say, I don't know that I, I deserve such high praise <laughs> because there are other wonderful Mormon playwrights who've come along. And Eric Samuelson is certainly one of those. And uh, I have called Eric... Our uh, propaganda, uh, how does it go in Russian? Uh, Agit propagandist, agitational propagandist, for his discussion, his treatment of social issues, of real problems that occur in our social life together. Right. And uh, so he, he deserves credit okay. for that. But here's, here's one of the things that I like most about your writing and your message, you say that the problem is that we should be taking the gospel more, not less seriously. <laughs> and that if we did, it would cause us to ask more questions. You've also suggested the good can be radical. One of our problems is we tend to stay in too close to the shore. Um, and we want too comfortable a margin of safety. So what can you say about discipleship as a kind of risk-taking venture? It needs to be that for all of us. And uh, the, the people we read about in Scripture, the prophets and others, apostles in the New Testament, they had to do that, you know. They had to make that. They had to walk the razor's edge as Christ himself did. And I think that uh, we need more of that challenge. I think it's available to us if we respond and go beyond just what is the the normal expectation. But I think as a people, we were so much like, in, a, in the United States, for example, we're so much like members of our greater society uh, who, who want, want comfort and who are so materialistic. And, you know, there's that wonderful admonition in the Doctrine, Doctrine and Covenants that we should not um, wait to be commanded in all things but do many things of our own free will. And some do, for sure, but many do not. And that's what I'm talking about. I call that condition the Mormon malaise. I think that's been used by others in another context, but the Mormon malaise. And I sense that around me. And here I am pointing the finger when I should probably be looking at where my thumb is pointing, you know. But. So. Well, here's something else you wrote. This is actually a quotation from Richard Ullman, but I think it feeds into yes, the same sensibility yes, uh -huh. that you're trying to inculcate. I quoted that in the book, right? Yes, yes, where he said, 
our responsibility is to save what is eccentric and singular from being sanitized and standardized. Isn't that good? Now, is this a problem or a challenge to Christian disciples everywhere? Or do you think there's something about Mormonism that creates a uniquely vexing set of challenges, given how, how thoroughgoing it is in its organization, its forms, its structures, its guidelines? I think we are far more structured as a, as a confession than most any other than I can think of at the moment. And, and that has its merits, but uh, uh, we, we have a saying in our ward that's come down to us from one of our leaders there. Like he, calls it, he called it the simple six. That if we would just all ab- adhere to the simple six, which included daily scriptural study, daily prayer, temple attendance, family home evening, and uh, to paying tithe and tithing, attending, attending meetings. I think that's what they are. And that's wonderful. That's what we all should be doing. Just this last week in our high priest group, I was quoting to them what I said, impulsively said to, to my wife a few days before, before. I said, you know, there's one thing that's wrong with the simple six, and that's that it, if we're not careful, it persuades us that we don't have to do anything more. And it's more the letter than the spirit. It can become that. And that's what uh, concerns me. Um, I've, I've quoted this before in other contexts, but I'm, I'm powerfully moved by Marilyn Robinson's line in Gilead about living life beautifully is as important as living life morally. And one reason why I think that's true is because as Mormons, we still bear, I think, a burden of the Protestant heritage. We still tend to resort to a conception of God as this sovereign deity who has our lives laid out for us. And there's yeah. a blueprint that we're looking to find the blueprint. Yeah, it's very regimented. Yeah, and I'd like to think that it's more a question. No, he gives us a, a canvas, and he says, paint a beautiful mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's where the risk is. We want to be... We want to feel like we're, we're in the groove, right? We're following this yes. preordained set of expectations. And, uh, and I think he wants us to take more risk. It, it seems to me that, that what's the most powerful um, Mormon mythos is the way that we reconceptualize the Garden of Eden. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the lesson that seems to be taught from Joseph Smith's re-rendering of that story is that the adventure lies outside the garden. I, I think I recall you're saying that in, in your uh, preface to somebody's book. <laughs> <laughs> I may have. <laughs> but it was your writing that prompted that and well, observation. What do you know? Well, I certainly agree with that. Yes. And uh, uh, I just think that uh, we're too much uh, in a rut at times waiting to be commanded, you know, to be told what we should do. But it comes with a cost, right? I mean, you paid a price. Sometimes you were... A little bit more provocative than some of the institutional um, voices yes, we're comfortable and, with. And I could have been punished in some form or penalized, but that didn't happen really. Other than that I was prematurely released as director of the honors program <laughs> because uh, I'm quite sure they didn't want somebody in so prominent a position on the faculty in case the play created even more uh, disfavor. Uh, even though it was very popular with its audiences. Well, it was a powerful, powerful message. And, you know, we sometimes become so fixated on the Mormon pioneers of Utah that we haven't paid due deference to those in other countries and other times. Indeed. You know, I've had the great privilege of getting acquainted with the true pioneers of the church in the 20th century. Uh, And the first group were the East German members. Right who were living under communism, and they were just so valiant. And I got, I had the great privilege before the wall, while in Berlin, to rub shoulders with a number of those people and their missionaries. Right, right. Uh, then the, the second group, of course, were those green members who were the Russian members who uh, joined right after the fall of the Iron Curtain, uh, somewhat later. And just before we went there on our mission to St. Petersburg, 
Boy, what, what a spiritual feast that was. My wife and I were recently invited by a wonderful, wonderful state president in Albania to oh come my. visit his saints and then to take a trip to Kosovo and speak to members in Kosovo. Kosovo, no less. And you spend a day with some of the saints in a place like that, and mm -hmm. suddenly your first world problems and challenges seem oh, pretty, yeah. pretty insignificant. Well, they're among those pioneers, Yeah, for sure. Yeah, great, great. People. Yeah. Paul Ricoeur, I think, referred to what he called the second innocence. And it seems that there's a, a challenge, especially for those who feel called to the life of the mind, mm -hmm. that they develop what uh, Dietrich von Hildebrandt called a hypertrophy of the intellect. Mm -hmm. um, and they so intersex, so exercise their, their minds that their, their spiritual cells become a little bit calloused. And their apprehension and engagement of the gospel is more a kind of intellectual apprehension and commitment to certain ideas and doctrines rather yeah. than yeah. a feeling yeah. experience yeah. of the divine fire. And I think no message is maybe more relevant to this, this moment uh, in our own well, history. Well, it has everything to do with what we call the spirit. And we invite that and we experience it in our interaction with others when we serve them at a very meaningful personal level. That's what, what we're supposed to do as home teachers and visiting teachers. And, and that does occur, I do believe. But, but that's also commanded. But there are immediate neighbors. There are members of our own family where we need to be able to minister to serve one another better than we often do. Yeah. Yeah, I agree fully. I want to turn to some other passages um, where you, you give a kind of defense of beauty and the beautiful in art and literature as uh, a particularly powerful prism through which to experience the gospel. So I'm reading from an essay called The Sacred in Literature. So I'm going to read two passages, and I'm going to ask you to, okay, to that, comment that on them. Okay, that was the would. one forum address I gave at BYU. Right. And this is from George Santiana. Yes. Beauty seems to be the clearest manifestation of perfection and the best evidence of its possibility. If perfection is the ultimate justification of being, we may understand the ground of the moral dignity of beauty. Beauty is a pledge of the possible conformity between the soul and nature, and consequently a ground of faith in the supremacy of the good. And then you go on to quote something even more specific, even a stronger claim by W.H. Auden. He said, every beautiful poem represents an analogy to the forgiveness of sins. Mm. Through its analogies, the goodness of created existence, the historical fall into unfreedom and disorder, <laughs> and the possibility of regaining paradise through repentance and forgiveness are recognized. Aren't those inspiring thoughts? They're beautiful. To claim one another, these souls that have come to inherit our DNA, uh, and that's true of our ancestors vis-a-vis uh, -vis us as well. We are, we are promised that we can have that relationship with them eternally. And uh, the, the, the uh, miracle of that, and we have that in common with all animals in terms of reproducing ourselves and all plants for that matter. But it's a glorious connection. You know, I, I kind of uh, think a lot of the essay that Phil Barlow wrote about God's Joseph Smith's project, that's, I think, what he's referring to there. He calls it that. But I, surely he believes, as I do, that that was also revealed, and it's also God's project, that um, we... Re, re, to that mend we, the fractured reality, that one? I, I, I think so. That we unite ourselves through faith, uh, eventually... As, as kin with everybody who has ever lived or ever will live yet. And when I think about what I would most like an angel to tell me someday. <laughs> yeah, if you could ask an angel any one question, what would that be, Tom? Would it be possible for us to get to know everyone uh, that ever lived, 
in the attorneys, why not? The great and the not so great, uh, and including all of our ancestors and kin and our horizontally related kin, our cousins, and get to know them well and care about them that much, that we'd have that affinity and that concord between us. Could I really shake Dostoevsky's hand someday? And Gustav Mahler's, for example. Yeah. I was going to ask what one thing you think Mormonism does really well, and is it related to this aspiration? I think maybe so. I, the uh, superstructure that we're given, uh, and the opportunity in it to, to serve and minister to one another as lay people, you know, and to me, one of the very uh, obvious marks of the apostasy was when that process became professionalized and uh, academic. And when a, a, a single person a, a, for his career would then do all of this for us, as it were, that sociality, have you ever heard that word anywhere else? Uh, meaning, I think, socialization and fellowshipping that we now experience, and I'm paraphrasing, will be more perfect and glorious in the hereafter. Well, it certainly needs to be more real than it is. We need to be more interested and caring toward our fellow members on, the, on a ward level. And this varies from ward to ward, I recognize that. That's what I, I'm really concerned about, uh, that we we'd be more that way. And that, and certainly within our families. Someone said to me recently that, and I mentioned this too, and he said, he'd lived uh, out of Utah, and he said, uh, well, uh, in Utah, we are mostly focused on our own families and their welfare, and I think we do that, and that's a wonderful thing, but it shouldn't stop at that yeah. at all. <clears throat> and, and Paul made that very clear to us when he said, ye are no longer strangers, but fellow citizens of the household of God. So, yeah. And there are some people who have that innate inclination and, and uh, are that caring and giving to others. I, I, that varies with, with the personality, yeah. too. But I don't, I don't think that means that we shouldn't all try to be more that way. One last question. Um, I'd like to conclude by asking about holy envy, Christopher Stendhal's phrase about uh. <laughs> admiring to the point of envying something about another religious tradition that we would like to bring into our own. What would that be? This, this might seem uh, facetious, trivial, but I'm always enthralled and I often try when I'm in a, a Russian-speaking country uh, particularly in Russia, to attend a Russian Orthodox service and to listen to the a cappella singing. Now, I know that the people who do that for the service are professional singers. They probably get paid to do it, but it is so lovely. And uh, I think there would be a way that we as a congregation could do that too. I've, I've really felt so bad that uh, certainly in Russia, and it might have been true even on my German mission, that the members were not trained the way we have been. We used to be in Sunday school with, with, uh, with the singing practice to sing parts. I remember, yeah. But that doesn't happen over there. It's all just singing the melody together. But I, I really would rather not have organs or pianos, just the singing, if it were, could be like the Russians' services sing. Beautiful. And that's a that's you know a very minor consideration, but I, I, there is a sense of reverence in those services for right. sure. Right. Even if the worship, the manner of worship, and here I'm becoming critical of them again, is very uh, sub, almost too submissive and in the genuflexing, there's there are no seats. You stand and then you kneel and you kiss the floor in front of icons. And it's, I'm sure, an import from the tradition of the uh, obeisance that was required of subjects to the czars. Uh, 
right. and to the early earlier emperors. And that is not how we view our father. But heaven. the music is tremendous, and boy, their early theology, especially you look at the early Christian church fathers from the East, and uh, they had a sense of that, didn't they? Beautiful. Yeah, definitely. So, well, Tom, is there any question you wish I'd asked today that I didn't? <laughs> I, I can't think of any. Well, We've covered a lot of ground, and, and I hope that whatever I had to say made some sense. Well, it did to me, and I'm really <laughs> grateful to you for being with us today. Well, thank you so much, Daryl. Thank you, Tom. So long. <laughs>